GM friends, and welcome to the future of gaming. You're listening to our weekly podcasts. We have Philip Collins, Devin Becker, and myself, Nico Vreke, the usual squad. And this week, we're talking about virtual worlds, and we'll see where the conversation brings us. It's been of a it's been a bit of a quiet week. Um, so yeah, um, not much happening in in blockchain gaming world. We were on holiday. I don't know. Uh, did you guys take uh, take off? A little bit the last week of the year. It's always a quiet week anyway, so it's my favorite week to kind of slightly take off. It's pretty mm. easy. <laughs> Don't feel like you're missing too much. Yeah, I tried to I tried to take off somewhere, but uh, all the plane flights being canceled made that uh, a non-starter, apparently, because <laughs> my flight got canceled, even though it wasn't really even going through any rough areas. And then I uh, for my New Year's, I got my power knocked out for about four or five hours thanks to uh, the NorCal sort of atmospheric storm that uh, I might get hit by tonight and tomorrow. So there's always a chance power ends up going out halfway through this just because trees are flying everywhere. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. You was in. Yeah, it's been then. crazy out here. Canceled yeah. flights, storms. It's the apocalypse. The <laughs> yeah. All right, good. So let's talk about virtual worlds. Devin, tell me what's on your mind uh, when it comes to virtual worlds and, uh, and um, what do you think is going to happen with them over the next year? Yeah, I think like uh, as we kind of try and figure out what the hell the metaverse stuff is, I think the virtual world thing is going to be kind of a hot part of that because people don't really have any other good ideas so far outside of that. And so we kind of have dipped in that direction a lot, kind of repeating the past with stuff like Decentraland and uh, and Sandbox. And like, interestingly, uh, one of my earlier predictions kind of ended up coming true, which was me saying that, uh, and I believe that I said this on a previous episode too, like what happens is they always go fragmented, right? They, they start with like a main world and then they start fragmenting and selling those fragmented islands or separate worlds. Decentraland exactly did that. Like they did their Decentraland worlds recently. And I, just for the fun of it, I actually registered FogDAO as one. So we have, we will have a FogDAO Decentraland private server, uh, nice. when, when I get around to actually deploying a, uh, a space or whatever there, but I did register the name. So we have that. It's like kind of an ENS name that you register and then you get a free Decentraland sort of space if you deploy one. So it's pretty interesting, Like, but they are going that direction, right? Which is exactly what I predicted because that has been the cycle of virtual worlds in the past where like if your main world gets crowded and empty and boring to people, uh, then you need to start selling like private worlds or, or getting interest around private worlds so people can kind of build up interesting things with some sense of control over it. Because the only problem is, like, you get into that territory and it's like, are they starting to devalue land? And you worry about that, like, all the people that invested in land, they're like, well, if people are going to private servers, then all the money I spent on land in the main server is suddenly worthless. And um, I think it's, it's an interesting direction we may see things go. And, like, Sandbox hasn't even really, like, totally fully opened up to a lot of stuff yet. So we haven't even really seen where that's going to go outside of, like, tons of brand partnerships. And so, like, now that brands are probably going to slow down a little bit, at least for the moment, in terms of like deploying metaverse stuff, uh, it'd be interesting to see what fills that vacuum. Isn't m making the world like giving people the ability to make the virtual world private or part of like a, to create a private part of a virtual world at odds with the value proposition of a lot of these metaverses, specifically towards the brands that purchased virtual lands in them? I mean, it, it aligns with the decentralized aspect, right, of Decentraland, and that's kind of part of the idea. And so, the, a, a, in my opinion, the selling the land was the part that was the opposite of the value proposition. Like, the, the thing's supposed to be decentralized and open, stuff like that. Selling land is actually the opposite of that. You're selling semi-centralized control and, dr like, driving it towards a centralized control structure uh, by selling land because you go, oh, well, I sell, we sell land to anyone. It's open to anyone. It's like, what do you think is going to happen? Eventually it's going to consolidate and be under the control of like a few big players. So you're not really decentralizing it by commercializing it. And so that was the part that was already at odds. So personally, I'd almost like to see them all kind of screwed over a little bit. I'm not a land investor. And I think land investment is like not a great way to run the virtual future. That's it's very dystopian. And, uh, and I'd be glad to see it undercut. But at the same time, yeah, if these businesses are built around that, which is why I don't see Sandbox doing that sort of thing anytime soon, because right now they're built around almost like a, a partnership advertising model where like they're trying to get brands into that space. And if they drive people to private spaces, that doesn't work, right? So while Decentraland doesn't have that same kind of partnership structure, they're a little more free to let people kind of diversify. And I'm sure they think, oh, well, 
you know, people probably won't do too much with these yet. We're just kind of opening it up and letting, but then like, you know, maybe the main world will link to these private worlds and like people will still have a reason to use the main world. But the problem is right now, the main world's still, I think, ghost townish. I mean, to be fair, I don't go around on it. I can't verify anecdotally or statistically if it's a ghost town, but you know, things tend to indicate that quite a, quite a bit depending on what's going on in the world at that time i mean they have like you know their festival kind of events and things like that but it seems like outside of those what do you do in there and that that's the persistent problem with virtual worlds is outside of like displaying your avatar there's often not much to do and uh, that's why i think the private worlds are kind of interesting because they can be built around a specific community or theme or group or whatever like that social aspect is a little more prominent it's not just walking around in a giant chat room. It's walking around in a chat room of like, it's more like a discord then for a, for a group. And that's why I think it, a fog down one was like, eh, that, that could be appropriate. Yeah. I think w the problem that I always see with a lot of the virtual worlds that come across our desks is to Devin's point, just what are you doing in the worlds? And it feels like a lot of the, the virtual worlds that have described themselves more as metaverse platforms have kind of taken the backwards approach of going brands first. And I think the, the, the best use case of brands entering the gaming or quote unquote metaverse world has probably been Roblox, honestly, because there is a captive audience. There's players there um, that, you know, you have your attention and it's, it's a captive audience. When I, when I think of things like sandbox, it seems like it's basically like a brand wasteland and I'm not really sure what else there's going to be. And maybe they can add new cool experiences on top of that. But I don't think going brand first really compels people to, to the platform. And it's kind of a similar thing with the, the private servers where a lot of times I've always thought of private lobbies and games as, as a derivative of the core experience. And, you know, you and all your friends are on the platform or on the game because you like the game. And the, the extension of that is you like playing that game together. And so I think there's a lot of that that can, can apply to the social side too. And, the only reason you care about you know, a digital identity on, on a given platform is because there's people there and, and there's a reason for staying. So it all just seems very backwards to me sometimes. And I find myself constantly asking, what are you doing in this virtual world? And most of the time, I don't feel like I get a great answer on that. And I think that's, that's where my core concern is, is that all of these virtual world projects are actually a, an offshoot of something that needs to be bigger, broader, and more compelling than just a place to hang out. Yeah. I, I, I keep wanting to like go in Decentraland and do stuff. And then I find myself going like, but then, then what am I going to do? Stand around and wait for someone to show up and be like, Hey, yeah. how's it going? And hope they yeah. talk back. Like what, like you could go in and play ice poker or something. Sure. But like outside of that, and it, it's funny. Cause like when you look at a lot of the, um, uh, analyst stuff, the reports around gamers and stuff like that. And you look at the demographics, um, no matter what it, game related industry, whether you're talking about physical games, like board games, talking about digital games, mobile games, console games, you notice there's a trend towards aging up uh, in that most like gamers are like 30 to, to 40 plus like nowadays it's continuing to skew up. Whereas when you look at the, the younger demographics, they're not they're not so much like traditional gamers. They're playing Minecraft, Roblox, and Fortnite, which Fortnite used to be at least creative, right? Because they had still had the kind of the, like the building mode in it that they sort of took out. But I just mean like they're actually already kind of in these metaverse virtual world kind of spaces that involve things like UGC and, uh, and, and playing with friends and hanging out. And like, so if anything, and you look to the younger audiences, like us as older gamers might be like scoffing at like that stuff to some extent, but at the same time, like if you look at where the aging up is going from these younger audiences, like it's going towards these more creative platforms that are a little more, uh, you know, metaverse ish than what we traditionally play. And like, as people get older and older, like our older demographic has more, ha has less free time to be participating, uh, in like that kind of stuff. And we just have like the, you know, pick up and console game, and then, and then move on kind of thing. So it'll be really interesting to see if that age demographic shift also like has a huge influence as those people age into their twenties, uh, and, and bring those creative worlds with them. And then like, again, like what you're saying, like, you know, Roblox is better than Decentraland because Roblox actually has stuff to do, even though technically both of those could be equal. Right. And then ob obviously like, uh, to, you know, Nico's investments core as well, uh, you know, is, is one that has potential for that sort of thing. And, it obviously you're not going to get most of the players creating, right? Like most players in Roblox are just consuming, not creating. But the fact that it's like, uh, you know, to, to, to steal from a, from a, a ethnic brand, like the for us, by us kind of thing. 
you know, like it's, you know, often made by kids for kids. Obviously there was like, you know, there's brands like adult brands that will try and build in there and stuff like that. And IP is trying to get involved, but they, they tend to understand their own culture a little better than we do. And I think us as like older gamers trying to build games for these kids can be like, uh, so out of touch. Like when I was running a, I was running an after school game design program for like at risk kids for a while, uh, for Salvation Army. And, uh, it was like junior high kids. And so I'd use them as my focus group as well. And I'd always ask them like, you know, like what games are you guys actually playing? Like, what are you into? And it was like outside of like Minecraft Roblox, like there was like a few retro games mixed in, but there wasn't like this, like outside of maybe some Nintendo stuff, there wasn't really like a core of games, like of, of what we think of as most games with this audience. And so I think there's like this disconnect. We're only really seeing through these, uh, you know, analyst reports that, that get put out. Mm -hmm. To me, the promise of these virtual worlds is <clears throat> very much similar to Roblox where the tools are there for people to build experiences. And then my question becomes, okay, what's the added value of Web3 here? And I see two parts, um, and I'd love for you to add to that. Well, part one is, it's a very, um, be because you can ha you have these, this land, this, this concept of owning land, um, you essentially incentivize people and groups to build the experiences with a built-in <coughs> monetization mechanic where you can like you, know, you can earn X amount of uh, the, the revenue generated on your plot of land on, in your experience that you've built. So there is the, I guess, the Roblox-style monetization of you can make money if people actually spend money in all y what you build, uh, but I guess a bit more transparent and a bit more open and flexible. Part two of the potential value is the implementation of uh, like third-party assets where certain NFTs can then be brought into these um, these virtual worlds and you can do stuff with the experience and you can token gate, right? I can see uh, you need to own this NFT to join either this event or this maybe even this specific instance of a virtual world, this private world. Um, these are the two that, that come to mind. Am, am I missing something here or, or would you agree that these are the, the main benefits of, of Web3 to these metaverses? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the you already make the obvious case for like an actual interoperability case, right? Where there's actually a use case for interoperability because it's existing within a single world slash universe. Uh, therefore, like interoperability is like a little bit baked in uh, as opposed to where it's like, you know, siloed games trying to communicate with each other via assets. I think obviously is a little more of a lift. Whereas like, uh, just for, for, for example, right, you're taking this virtual world and you've already got a shared rendering system like for all of the assets and shared format, uh, you know, standardized, like you're, you're handling a lot of the, the issues that our operability like runs into just by default as part of like being in the world. And so that, that in itself is useful, right? Like, in, and you can already do that in core, uh, w with stuff as well. Like as an example, something else that you can do it with, uh, with web three, right? And you can token gate or I mean, NFT gate and stuff like that in it already as well. And Decentraland does some of that as well. Like with, um, Decentral games with ice poker, Right, like you need the the um, to earn from the poker, you need the actual like wearables, and there has been some cases of like um, NFTs from the outside coming in as like uh, you know cloned wearables that I think we've discussed before, like ways back, um, and so like that that case definitely the monetization is the trickier aspect, right? Like we saw how Roblox does it, right, as a way to give kids a chance to be able to make money in theory, right? Like that's at least how they position it, mm -hmm. um, and. It's, it's interesting because like it gets gets pretty messy once you get crypto involved, whereas like both, um, you know, say Second Life with the Linden dollar and Roblox with the Robux, um, they have like their conversion program, right, to like their off ramps. And that's like an important part of it is having the off ramps, whereas uh, you, you do have to wonder, like, do we need the off ramps with it or are kids already going to be so crypto native at some point that we don't have to care about the off ramps or like are they just going to take their money and spend it within the ecosystem? and buy stuff within there. Like, let's say, let's say normally they would take the money that they earn for making their game. They go buy some clothes, right? Well, maybe they're just buying wearables in the virtual world instead. And they could keep the money in the ecosystem and not have to like off ramp it. But that's, I feel like a ways out right before there's value there. Um, and it's obviously there's like stuff in the real world. You need like food and other stuff, but kids have pretty discretionary spending, uh, from whatever money they make because they don't have to, you know, pay rent or anything like that. So it, 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 the monetization part, I think, will be the, like the, the more iffy part, right? Because land, like I said, is kind of a, it's a very commercializing the creativity and like you have to find ways to 
handle the monetization flow well and there's legal implications and there's like the whole idea with kids and spending money and I think it gets pretty messy but I think the the interoperability part I think is one of the stronger elements in it because you can already do that to some extent with Roblox you can see how that's beneficial and then even with brands like you know people bring in like Sonic the Hedgehog or something into there as something that can be treated with as an NFT asset that could be part of multiple games and things like that in a single shared space I think is really cool yeah no, I'm, I'm pretty much pretty much echo that. I think one of the most interesting use cases on the creator side is just on the incentive structures and being able to to accurately reward people for the contribution based on on usage and how much they are actually providing to the to the ecosystem. So, a lot of interesting stuff there. I mean, you can and platforms like Roblox have proven that you can kind of incentivize creators without blockchain. You know, there are the the web two traditional ways of of doing profit sharing and, and giving people credit for the for the work that they've done. I think, you know, Web3 can add some some more clean structures for that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we're, we, we always come back to it. People only want to build on platforms where people want to play <laughs> and people only want to play on platforms where people want to build if, if creator, if, if community generated creations are, are at the core of it. Um, and then, so I think that you're web, web three or not, that's, that's kind of the, the underlying requirement for, for all of it. So I don't know, I, I'll, I'll be curious to see if, if blockchain integrations on these types of platforms ends up being slow until people just become comfortable with crypto, uh, whatever that driving force is, whether it's games or one of these platforms, it just seems like it's, it's a little bit of a chicken in the egg where people will adopt blockchain on these types of platforms when they're comfortable with it, but what's going to make them comfortable with it? Ideally gaming, but it's unclear how that's going to play out and, and what that driving force is going to be. And I think one of the, one of the interesting things is I feel like over the last 18 months, there has been a lot of friction reduced from blockchain, right? If, if you told us last June in June of 2021, that we are gonna have the types of experiences that we have today, it's definitely an improvement. And there's a lot of people pushing that and yet it still hasn't really resulted in in substantial adoption. Um, I think that goes back to proving the point on like content is king for this this type of situation. But um, but yeah, this this chicken and the egg problem is is complicated in terms of thinking about the value that blockchain does add because it can't really add value until People, people perceive its value. Right. Pe- people are the ones driving the value because they're the ones subjecting, like coming up with the subjective value, right? Uh, yeah. That's the only that's the only way things have values if someone wants them. Uh, but I think the, the game part underlying is like an interesting aspect because you look at, say, if, if we were to take Minecraft, Roblox, and Fortnite as examples, right? Minecraft and Fortnite clearly built off a game first. Even though Minecraft shifted toward creative mode, at first, like the, the, the game structure at which resources were scarce and you built your way up and all that stuff gave value to different types of resources, gave value to the, the interactions within the game and gave a structure to them. And then people kind of freewheeled off that eventually. Right. And then uh, Fortnite was kind of the same way in that, like the lobbies and other things kind of turned into those areas that like, because people didn't care as much about the game elements and kind of grew out of those a little bit and started socializing and stuff. Same thing kind of happens with MMOs, right? Where people kind of like, at some point the end game just becomes social play. Um, And so Roblox, on the other hand, didn't have a great killer app at first. Like we we like to treat Roblox like it's an overnight success, but it was like a really slow burn. Like it took what was it like uh, ten years at least to start to really get traction uh, as as a platform. And so uh, what's funny is like I guess that means that that half the people that adopted the platform weren't even born when it started uh, because of the you know the age demographic. But it's uh, you know it's one of those things where obviously you know, killer app is king, right? Like any platform, killer app is, is, is important. If you can't get people on the platform first and chicken and egg it, it becomes a problem. And so I think with these ones, like let's say, uh, you know, Decentraland or Sandbox, if they could find one killer app and then build out from there, like that might be enough. Like, like if say, let's say Ice Poker was just, everyone was obsessed with it and it became the next new thing. And then everyone was in there. And then it just kind of like Halo effect, uh, you know, brought people into the ecosystem and then they started building other stuff because then you get other things near the ice poker that people might be like, you know, I'm bored of ice poker for this moment. Let me go see that other thing over there and, you know, expand, expand. Um, but again, like you need that kind of, what are you doing in this place first? And then you can expand out for there. Like, I think 
MMOs used to be a great example of that till they stopped kind of letting people build in there. Like you go from UO to WoW and it's like it was drastically different uh, going from like a very creative sandbox kind of world to a very theme park kind of thing. And so MMOs kind of cut themselves out of that fun outside of EVE. And it's just, I would like to see, you know, we don't need them to be full MMOs. We just need like some level of, of gameplay in these worlds that is compelling enough. And you see like, you know, meta try and get involved, right? And they do stuff like meta horizons and it's just like these garbage theme parks. Uh, and they want to like have like some kind of killer app, right? But the, like they might buy Beat Saber and fitness apps and all that stuff. But unless they can shove it in horizon worlds, like no one's going to care. And so, like they could bring people to the quest, but they can't bring people in, into Horizon Worlds. And like that's a big problem for them is and at some point, like you almost just have to like you either got to cultivate that kind of uh, thing, like meaning like you get like a big platform fund, just like the blockchains do. And you start cultivating projects, seeding them, incubating them, whatever you want to call it, throwing money at the problem, basically, which I think Facebook tries to do. But I don't think they really are disciplined enough to do it well. Um, and and do that sort of thing on your platform. Like, uh, like I think some of them try and do that already. Like, I'm not saying they aren't doing that, but I don't think they've succeeded yet in finding that big, like successful thing. Like the way, uh, you know, like, uh, Microsoft was with Xbox first trying to find killer apps and bringing people over. And that helped bootstrap Xbox into a relevant console. And you had the console exclusive wars between them and Sony to try and keep people on the platforms and all that stuff. It's, it's, it's clearly a relevant problem as much as we'd love to say people love the technology or the platform or the possibilities of it until the possibilities are like realized people just will be like, eh, you know, and some of that's down to tooling as well. Like not just the money, but also like making sure the tools are like really good to the point where people can do it. But I think sometimes you just have to find the right person with the right idea to just like click it, kick it off. And, and more often than not, it's accidental rather than like truly cultivated you just have to kind of like have a whole bunch of hackathons and game jams and stuff like that until you hit those. Are there any examples of UGC created successes that kickstarted the success of a platform as a whole? Um, if you look at Minecraft and, and Fortnite, both of those were built about a, uh, around a core loop that was built by the company itself. Right. Right. Um, Maybe Roblox could be the best example. I believe Adopt Me is like, was that like the, did that kickstart Roblox's success or is this one, there one game we can point to? I, I bet there was one. I just don't know Roblox's history well enough to like point to it, but I bet there was like one or two. Yeah. yeah back, I think back around 2015 is actually a really cool YouTube video um, that maybe we can link in the discord showing like the most popular games on Roblox over time. It's kind mm. of one of those time-lapse yeah, flow yeah. charts and love those. there's some really noticeable jumps and I'm blanking on which title actually kicked it off kind of in like the mid 20 teens. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the driving force. And I truly do view Roblox as a super anomaly in, in this regard where no other UGC platforms been able to really succeed at scale without, without core IP. I mean, if we think about UGC today or, emergent gameplay i mean fortnite creatives up at the top minecraft and inherently creative titles up there a lot of people on like gta role playing um there's these core ips that suck people in that they then want to continue to extend and expand and in a lot of ways i think right now it kind of makes me more excited about things like modding and emergent gameplay over what we've traditionally viewed as, as user generated content and just giving people the ability to create games um and are I think you saying on-chain games philip is, is that what you're telling me I mean, I mean, I guess it could be, but... Well, the um, problem is interconnected mods. Like, that's what I'd like to see is right now we, we, we have modding, but er mods are like standalone games, essentially. Uh, yeah, they're still built on yeah. having the core game, but they're more like a DLC or an expansion, and they're not really interconnected. And I think that's maybe the missing piece is like you have these really cool mods going back to, you know, years ago, like, you know, decades of modding. Like has shown that, but like imagine, like imagine if you know you took something like Skyrim, right? And all these mods were like different realms within the same Skyrim world that you could travel to, and there was like then it's like now it's like a metaverse in itself where these mods are interconnected in some way rather than just being standalone things. Because like you look in you know mod servers and stuff, for example, you have the issue where you have to share the mod. Like you, you either have people have to install the mod ahead of time. Or there has to be some method within the platform to distribute the mod files to people connecting to that server, right? Whereas like a virtual world is meant to be a shared streaming platform that's like built on the idea of streaming content in real time. 
And so, like, if we could find a middle ground there, and maybe that's what Raph Coster's kind of going towards as well with his cloud streaming stuff that he's trying to build. Um, but that's that's maybe we, where we need to really go is because I think you're right where mods, like, are probably a better way to look at it. And, like, GTA and Arma 3 were, like, great examples of worlds that became, like, role-playing worlds and mod worlds and stuff like that. But they have the issue of, like, server fragmentation uh, and other things that they haven't really solved yet. And it, let's say, let's say, uh, you know, Decentraland had a thing where that, where it was very easy to build a mod of like the core game. If Decentraland had a core game and like have those as, as separate lands within it, like that would probably work to some extent, right? Like even Roblox is like, you're still kind of building off mostly the content that they provide you, like the pieces, the Legos that they kind of give you and then kind of kit bashing them basically. Um, and, and that's almost a form of modding in that way. Same with what Core is kind of doing, right? Where they give you the assets and you kind of kit bash them together. And uh, I just, I would love to see even Decentraland or Sandbox really actually just have Core gameplay. Like, uh, even if it was like low level, like enough to have some like Minecraft level economics to it. Um, or I'm sorry, I guess I don't want to say economics because I don't want to sound financial. More like a resource system like some some sort of resource that makes sense in the game um that drives some sort of base level play that could be built on i think if they could add that if they could take mana in sandbox or sand in sandbox and actually give some sort of like base level interaction with that resource as well as like like resources within the worlds like some kind of you know like the way minecraft has you know different resources like you know building up glass or crafting things or whatever um that might be enough to even get people going because then if people can mod on top of that um, into their little areas, then I think you could have much more of a thriving ecosystem. At the end of the day, I think one of the great things about having a core IP before creating some kind of extensible platform is really just a sense of structure and people like structure. I think fundamentally people like and benefit from structure in a lot of cases or in almost all cases. And in when you, when you have a core IP, the, the, the guidelines or the boundaries are set and people also like they like structure. They also love pushing boundaries and you kind of know the baseline for what you're working with when there's a core IP that you're able to play and an IP that you care about and an IP that other people that you're around care about. And I think that motivates people to build for peers, you know, build using characters or IPs that they already are invested in and kind of knowing what the threshold for what's possible is from professional developers and just taking those tools and, and expanding it and pushing the limits. And I think sometimes that's lost on, on other no code or low code platforms where there is no clear definition of what is possible. And so you can't really keep pushing it forward. And so it's a bunch of surface level fragmented ideas and it takes longer to expand and find out what actually is possible and, and what are games that people want to play because there's not that, that baseline and not necessarily saying that's the case for Roblox and that's why it took so long. But I don't know. I think it, I think it's hard to, hard to facilitate effective discoverability when there is no baseline in a way. Yeah. I contrast Mario maker with something like level head, right? Where like they're both doing the same thing, but one has a core IP that's solid Mario stuff. And the other one's trying to be a new IP. And I, I got to imagine that if you looked at the numbers, the traction between Mario maker and level head is pretty significant even though like yeah. level heads probably got some awesome stuff to it uh as just an example of one like but at the end of the day like people care about um some building on something they already like uh mm -hmm. even though like there wasn't a mario game built into mario maker it was built off of like the idea of the mario games and people really stretching it and what's funny is they actually started building it to be a little more virtual world-esque uh in the sequel where they started doing the thing where you go on like the little endless runs where it selects levels and you have persistent lives and stuff like that. So like they started kind of building in the direction of it being like a, like, like I was saying about mods where the, if they had some kind of shared space. Um, so like they were kind of going in that direction, who knows, maybe they'll do Mario maker three, or I would love to see them actually do something like Mario maker with Zelda. Uh, I think that could be a pretty amazing thing along the lines of what I was saying about Skyrim that, uh, that could be a pretty cool, even if they just made it more like, you know, the SNES version of Zelda um, could be an amazing Mario maker style. Um, IP platform. And so assuming that we need a cool, a good, very good core loop or at least a strong IP to build upon, to build a successful UGC metaverse upon, what's the role <coughs> of Web3 here? Like where is the most value added in your opinion or is it really um, mostly a, yeah, something like separate that doesn't add that much, much value? 
it's it's interesting that the IP situation in in um, Web three for a couple of reasons. One, like obviously it's a sticky sticking point, right? When it comes to like a lot of issues about ownership and things like that, and even like just you know the counterfeiting is a big thing that they have to deal with all the time in the marketplaces and um, that sort of decentralized ownership concept and validation stuff. But then there's also the idea that like so many of the NFTs that sell are people trying to build brand new IPs and building lore and community things around just an image, a series of images. And so it's very interesting to see this idea of IP being thought of as a community project rather than as a commercial product even though it's commercialized through selling the NFTs, like they're trying to build these up as community-based things, almost kind of taking it like a little more street level kind of uh, uh, products, which is like an interesting thing. We haven't really successfully done all that well in the past, right? Like there, there hadn't been a lot of great community centered IPs built up. It mostly had been kind of top down commercialized stuff that people adopted, maybe modified and spinned off stuff like that. But now we have people just trying to build them like straight up from creating these projects uh of of ips and so like maybe that'll be an interesting space in it like where you see that a lot where people try and uh call their uh, nft ip a metaverse like you're, you're joining this metaverse by owning these uh nfts and like you're being part of this world that we're creating together of like lore and like we're gonna eventually make games and virtual worlds around it and, like who knows maybe one of those could actually end up being a virtual world that matters um but i think ip ownership is like still an unsolved problem in Web3, but it's such an important forefront problem that I think we kind of have to tackle it. And if we do tackle it well, that could be like a big jumping point for uh, the the benefits to this stuff, right? Uh, even like when we comes when it comes to dealing with brand IPs that exist, like, and what you can do with them. Like if I get a, uh, say a Starbucks NFT and someone makes interoperability for it that's not permissioned by Starbucks, like that starts to become complicated, right? But this idea of like modding through interoperability rather than modding as in like modifying files uh, starts to become an interesting aspect. Like if I just be like, you know what? I hate the main game of Axie and I don't care about what Sky Mavis says. I'm going to make games that use Axies and like F them if they, if they try and stop me, cause I'm just going to make the art different uh, so that I'm not violating their copyrights or whatever. I don't care about their stupid license and just get extremely punk with it. Uh, it gets pretty interesting, obviously, like depending on which jurisdiction you're in and legal and all that stuff. And that's what I mean. Like it's, it's a problem at the forefront that needs to get tackled and I hope does. And you have stuff like CC zero trying to approach that or other, other sort of like ground level stuff, trying to figure that out. But I think that's the core of where that battle happens to decide how web three could, how, how relevant web three could be to these things. Yeah. I think a lot of times I, I view web three as almost like a secondary question in these situations, especially when there's a core IP involved. I think building out a core IP is, is kind of its own challenge and its own hurdle. And as you look to build around that IP and build a community or a market for user generated content, that's really where blockchain can be part of the back end or a tool for facilitating that and, and effectively enabling people to own and monetize their, their time, effort and creations. Um, but you know, if we're talking purely on like a virtual world UGC platform, I think that just creating a compelling core experience comes first and then the, the, the web three aspect of that is kind of a derivative of how you manage people and let people manage their items more so than a determinant factor of success for, for the IP or for the core experience that they're creating. I'd love to see an IP just go viral, just off straight embracing remix culture. And like, you know, the way we've seen memes like take off over time, right. By being basically a remix culture that people like participate in. Obviously that's very spread out. You know, it's not one particular IP, although it's very IP violating because more often than not, it's usually like a lot of times referencing like existing stuff out there that, you know, is, is branded in some way. But like this idea of like uh, loot is a perfect example of that, right? Where it fully embraced remix culture as a, as a methodology for going viral. Um, and, and maybe there could be other projects like that, that are, that gain traction by giving up control rather than trying to manually create that traction. Uh, and we may get a mix of that, right? Like some that are successful via just, you know, bootstrapping themselves. And then some that are successful by allowing the community to bootstrap it for them. If they just happen to hit the right chord. Uh, I, I I'd like to see more loot kind of projects that could take off that maybe don't do things the same way as loot did, but still embrace that kind of, uh, you know, do what, do what you will with this stuff kind of mentality. If I summarize 
our conversation here is, in the words of Devin, we need to get punk with it. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> that's my big takeaway. I'm all, yeah, I'm all about that angle for it. Get street, get punk with it. Like, I think uh, that's the only way this stuff's going to push forward because, like, otherwise it pushes dystopian, right? Where we, like, if it's corporate top-down control, like, you know, that. but, but I'm a big cyberpunk kind of nerd. Always have been. So, like, I guess I'm already, I already lean that direction. Uh, just because I think that is where things get interesting. Because if you look at, like, cyberpunk and a lot of these other punk cultures, it's it's almost like uh, IP-based kit bashing as kind of a way of, like, looking at, things where they're kind of subverting and modifying and uh almost undermining like uh brands and like and and hacking them together and doing things that are just unpermissioned with them but still often in sort of a remix culture kind of angle and i think that like embracing that can make you like successful if you do it right rather than trying to dictate what people do because there's a certain energy uh, like a creative energy behind that sort of punk culture that you could tap into if you hit it right, which is exactly what loot did, for example. Right. It was, but it was like specifically like the crypto nerds that were like really into like, what can we do with this interoperability now? Uh, you know, that struck that chord with that particular type of crypto punk. Uh, but I think that again, that's like a relatively untapped well of energy in like youth culture. And, and I'm talking about like these skewing very youth centric for the future of this stuff. Like then tap into that, tap into that in Roblox or wherever people of that, you know, age demographic and like the, you know, the teens to twenties happen to be really excited about. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a hard question and I want an answer of all of the existing blockchain based metaverse plays, which one do you think has most potential and why? <clears throat> I, I want to say sandbox for one reason and a decentral and for another. So I want to say Sandbox for the fact that they they are good at working with brands. That's what Animoca Brands exists for. It was a spinoff specifically building off their success and working with brands. And they've done that, right? And that can help bring people in. And it, it, like they do get a lot of traction each time they run a season. But I don't think they've fully showed their cards as far as how the UGC stuff goes. And I think if they handle it really well, there's potential. However, the core gameplay stuff they've demonstrated so far has been not compelling. But they have tried to have at least gameplay elements where they have, like, the platforming or, like, hitting with swords or guns. Like, just really simplistic stuff. If they could figure out a way to make that core, like, resource economy kind of stuff work with the rest of that stuff, I think they have a lot of potential. And they are a game company first. Uh, and I think they, you know, they have experience like the, the Pixel comes from doing the Doodle God series that did really well. Like they, they have potential to do it. I just don't know what their full plan is and whether or not they can execute on that. But looking at their early presentations and stuff back before like Sandbox really was out, like they were in the right mindset for it. And then Decentraland, I, I feel like also has potential because of their openness and being less of a top-down control but at the same time, I think if they can't get some real killer apps going or build that sort of core fundamental gameplay, then they kind of end up dead in the water. But I am interested to see where like the private worlds thing goes. Because let's say, for example, a private world takes off and really brings people to the platform for that private world. Like, let's say, let's say people didn't use Discord until there was one really popular Discord that everyone wanted to be in. And then they got, they, you know, they download the program, set up an account and they do it to, for that. And they end up also then, you know, the people go like, I really like this discord, but I'm going to go set up my own and so on and so forth. And it spreads out from there. So like, I could see that kind of thing, potentially even the private worlds helping the main world of Decentraland. If the main world becomes like, you know, the welcome world, the lobby, whatever you want to call it, the introduction world. And then that can spin off to those private worlds, but like a private world alone could bring it like, just, just look at what, you know, Joe Rogan does for, for Spotify's podcasting. Uh, even though like it was a big expense in like podcasting, like, cause they were struggling to take off on podcasting. And I don't want to say for sure. Cause I haven't looked at the numbers to prove that like Joe Rogan changed that, but he's definitely had a big impact on people using Spotify for podcasting, which, Hey, you might be listening to this right now on, on Spotify. And maybe it's because Joe Rogan was on there. I don't know. I'm whether you're a fan of him or not, like he has a big impact. Right. And so that's, that's kind of my, my two part answer where it's like, could go either way. And there could be a dark horse, uh, among the many attempts out there. I think I'm pretty bearish on the, the traditional like open world web three platforms we've seen like Decentraland and and Sandbox. To to caveat that, 
in, in any kind of platform where, where users are able to build on top of it, it's kind of like an anything can happen situation where you never know who's going to build something that blows up. And, and then as we've talked about, that one experience can bleed into others where you come for that and you start exploring around it, but you always have like that nucleus that you can continue to, to revert back to. I think when I think of like web three metaverses that I'm, I'm more interested in, I'd honestly go back to more of the, the games with the social, social metal loop around them. So like maybe like a Civitas or a block Lords or something of that nature, where it's kind of like a metaverse world, but there's also core gameplay that underpins your social status, your assets value and, and whatnot. So I think I get more excited about those types of experiences than the, than the traditional like open world. I can own land and, and build experiences. I want to see how it. those bridge into being not just a single world though. Like, cause yeah. y- y- you can't call Fortnite a metaverse just because people hang out in there. It's just a game that happens to have social aspects, just like yeah. people hanging out in town and wow, doesn't make it a metaverse. And like, I think a lot of people think or for, forget that metaverse is supposed to mean like a university of universes, not a single universe. People like keep, that's part of the reason I want to bring up virtual world is people can keep confounding metaverses with virtual worlds. And like, they're not the same. Like virtual world is a singular thing. Uh, whereas metaverse is meant to be a, a plural thing. And I think like, I, I agree that there's like absolute potential in what you're talking about. And like you, even if you were to take like Minecraft and say like each person's server, if they were connected through some bigger hub world multiverse kind of thing, then maybe that could be considered a metaverse. But I, I want to see like, if, if you're right, how people bridge that gap to it being a metaverse instead of, and maybe Epic's the one to do it because they're obviously putting tons of weight behind seeing how they can expand out the world of uh, a Fortnite, And they built the technology with unreal engine that can potentially power a lot of that. So maybe that is the one that, that branches out from something like that. But I, I don't know how they make that leap. Like how you take say GTA five and GTA five role-playing servers and consider that a metaverse instead of just a series of mods. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's the interesting thing though, is I think that the difference between virtual worlds and metaverse to me is virtual worlds exist and metaverses don't <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, where like, if you think about like metaverse and virtual worlds, I think of like platforms and games, like we've kind of dealt with that in the past where like, you could say that growing up PlayStation network was like a metaverse because all of my different virtual worlds of, you know, call of duty and sports games and whatever, um, were, were kind of under that social sphere that Sony set up for me. Um, and so I don't know. I, I, I think like gaming already is a a series of virtual worlds in a lot of ways. Right. And I think that's totally true that like Fortnite in my mind is a virtual world, not really a metaverse. Um, but I think I also think of Fortnite as a game and Epic is creating a platform for that game. And so like, it's kind of like a, a terminology, um, discussion, that I think we get lost in sometimes. I love arguing about the semantics over it though, because it teases out our biases towards what we actually think about these things. And then you have to start actually addressing your assumptions going like, well, you were just kind of assuming this or like just thinking that, but it was unstated. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think like the more public debates we get into over what the metaverse is or what we're, it's not then about what the metaverse is at the end of the day. It's about what we want it to be and teasing that out. So we actually are actually saying what we're trying to achieve instead of just talking around it all day by using terminology. Yeah. What, are what do you the, think about that? So, Nico? so we had a, <laughs> we had a um, down square yesterday. We talked a bit about metaverses and because we talked about the best or the most promising metaverse out there. And uh, one person said that they believe that the most successful metaverse is just Discord. And um, I would even argue the internet beats that, like trumps yeah, that. Yeah. Then, then if you're going then, that then, direction, like the internet yeah. wins. Yeah, I think. Uh, and so uh, I fully agree that, uh, you know, defining these things before we start predicting uh, makes a ton of sense. Um, cool. All right, guys, this was, uh, as usual, a great discussion. The future of virtual worlds. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, like if you want to come help me build out that uh, that fogged out Decentraland one, because I know Jack all about building in Decentraland right now. So if anyone wants to help with that, please hit me up. All right, public call out. Uh, reach out to Devin and um, help him. And we can do, maybe start doing these recordings or, or even better town squares um, in these virtual worlds. That, that should be fun. Good. All right, Devin, Phil, thanks for joining. Um, appreciate it. A listener, thank you for listening in. 
Um, if you haven't already, join us in the Discord so you can have these discussions with us. Um, we have weekly town squares where we, we all chat together, get together, and discuss uh, topics related to this. So uh, feel free to join, let your voice heard, be heard. And um, with that, we're out, and we look forward to speaking to you next week. Ciao.